Good afternoon, good morning everybody, wherever you are around Australia, and welcome to the Tips to Effectively Grow Your Firm in 2020, presented by Your Business First. My name is Darren Sherry, I'm the CEO and Principal Consultant, and I'll be hosting the webinar for you today. So the agenda for today is that we've broken up the um, presentation into three parts. One is getting back to basics, what activities you need to do, um, and other options available to you to grow your firm, and then we'll also discuss next steps. So, but before we get started, we want to know and we want to get an understanding of what the um, have a start with the end in mind. What are you trying to build here with your accounting firm and your accounting practice? What does your business look like in the in the next two, three, five, ten years time? Are you building something that you want to build and you want to achieve for your clients and it's part of your part of your succession as well moving forward? So what, when we go through the webinar today, please keep that in mind when we're going through all the tips and tips and tips um, and ideas that we'll, we'll, we'll be sharing with you today. This webinar and the content provided in this webinar is designed to free up your time so you can focus, focus more time with your clients and mentor your team and train them and, and to add more time to work on your business rather than in your business. The ideas and hints and tips provided to you today are at a high level and due to time constraints, um, we've only got 60 minutes for, uh, for this webinar today. Um, we won't be providing instructions uh, with you, but we're more than happy to talk to you after the webinar if there's anything that needs to be clarified. The ideas and the tips can be, um, some of it can be implemented um, straight away and some of it can be um, implemented over time. Um, and the great thing is that you may have already implemented some of these tips as well. And to that, um, thank you. That's great. Congratulations. And I hope um, we're not wasting your time here today. And, and at the same time, we hope you can get some more ideas when it comes to um, developing your business to effectively growing it next year. So let's get started. So the first part of the agenda is getting back to basics. And the key areas we, we're gonna to talk to you about today is the database, team, software, policies, procedures, and workflow. The first thing we'll talk about is the database. Even up to five, even up to five years ago, um, when most of the accounting firms were running on a, on a desktop and using a server, we had multiple databases of our clients. One potentially stored in our practice management system. Another part of our clients' details was stored in our um, SMS software, and, po and possibly a third um, bit of information about our clients was stored in our co corporate compliance software. With the advent of cloud computing and and the, the disruptions brought into the industry, there's a possibility that we can have all our client information um, stored in this in a centralized database. And if any changes that need to be made, will be filtered down to those relevant software providers accordingly. One thing I'm a big, a big fan of is um, the classification of, um, of clients. And I'll preface this by saying is that you can classify your clients however you want to, and there's no hard and fast rule. There's a tr traditional process of the A, B, C, D type clients. And a D type client doesn't necessarily have to be a client who you don't want to work with or, or doesn't pay or um, is very difficult, it was very difficult to work with. A D type client could be someone as simple as an income tax return, um, PAYD person, in which we want to uh, continue working with because in the hope um, that they aspire to open up a, a business from further down the track. So I think it's important to classify your clients into, into A, B, C, D. However you, you classify them is totally up to you, but it needs to be communicated and well with, with, within, your, within your accounting team as well. And that leads down to having um, classifying clients into groups and identifying those clients who are, are shareholders or directors or trustees or beneficiaries of, of, of particular entities and getting an understanding of what, what um, client uh, are involved in that particular group for capacity planning purposes and also for purposes in relation to WIP, um, debtor management, um, etc. And that leads to the next important phase in relation to having client groups is allocating our accountants to, to those groups. As I mentioned from the outset, this, is, this webinar is designed to free up your time and one of the things what we can do is allocate 
um, accountants to the uh, to those clients or to those client groups, and that can be the first point of contact. Now, obviously, there's some some training and education that needs to be involved and obviously transitioning the clients from and getting to be making them aware that they're that the accountant is going to be the first point of contact but you're still looking after and maintaining the file as well a great way to do that is in in the first meeting that you have with the with the um, client that you can introduce the, the accountant then and there so they have a um they can uh, have a physical presence and also um, create, hopefully create the report virtually straight away. By freeing up your time, what we hope to do is that you can have more meetings and one, whether they're one-on-one -on -one, face to face or over the phone with your top 20 or 50 clients on, on a regular basis. And again, that could be down to the classification as well. How do you keep in contact with clients? As another bit with respect to having a, um, a streamlined database. Is it via social media? Is it via the newsletters? Um, uh, even is it could be phone calls? Are we keeping our contact with our clients on a and uh, with the A type clients on a, on a monthly basis, and the B type clients maybe on a quarterly basis as well? The bottom line here is that it's um, and with the disruption and the, the progress of accounting firms these days, as you um, are aware, this is more of a relationship building and relationship maintaining exercise with our with our clients um, moving forward. And do we need to stack some clients? Um, there are there are um, firms out there do have that have clients who they just do not want to deal with for whatever reason, whether it's non-paying, um, writing off of whip. Um, and always, always taking up time for answering queries in which we, which, even though we build that they won't pay for or we need to write off. But at the same time, can we um, replace those clients with either um, value added services to our current clients or replace them with um, new clients coming on board? It's something that we need to consider when we're trying to grow our business in, in, in 2020. Another aspect as well is getting back to basics is with our team. As I mentioned before, we want to have the right people managing our clients. So not only are they their first point of call, but they can manage their clients from a capacity point of view and, and job management point of view as well. But finding the right team um, when you need them is exceedingly tough and we're all aware of that. Um, my, my, my belief is that we should keep in contact with our um, rec recruitment recruiters on a regular basis with um, two or three of them. I understand that they are quite expensive, but at the same time, if they provide you with a with an accountant or a team member that is um, that has the wow factor, then there's something that we need, seriously need to consider, even though we may not be looking for an accountant at that particular point in time. But that accountant needs to needs to be the right person for the role. They need to join you on the journey, and they have to embrace their mission, vision, and values of your business as well. We need to consider as well how much um, we need to delegate and, and empower that person. And, under, and that's obviously stems from their qualification and their stature as well. Another thing we need to provide is that that career path. One thing that prevents clients, or sorry, one thing that prevents accountants from staying on board is that there's no career path and there's no real um, avenue to, to growing within, within the firm. If we can provide a, a a career path that's aligned to the goals um, with uh, with your firm. Um, that would be um, that would be great for for the team member. Reason being that they'll have a proper um, training and career path towards what they need to achieve. There will be co competencies in place for each role within the business and what they need to achieve to reach that particular role. And they can have possibly, depending on the size of the firm and the type of firm that you have, they could they can excel and specialise in a, in a particular area of accounting whether it's um, in relation to tax, um, business, business advisory, or even um, computer software and cloud software. Another thing as well is the motivation and, and rewards. Quite often is that, the, um, and from a number of accounting firms I've spoken to, there's no real reward system, and it is just a, um, a bonus at Christmas time that they give to, they give to the employee with no real, um, I suppose evidence of how they how they how they achieved or how they earned that reward or that bonus. One thing we do though is is consider is that with as far as the bonus structure is concerned, so we sit down with our team member 
and we talk to them about exactly how we want to reward them or what they need to achieve to entitle them to that reward or to that bonus. But that bonus may not necessarily be monetary. That bonus could also relate to, that bonus could also relate to, um, they may want um, some income protection insurance or a membership to a gym or a night out to, or a night out with their partner somewhere. But we have to make sure that that bonus equates to uh, the dollar value of the entitlement of the of the of what they've what what they've achieved. So, for example, if they're entitled to a two thousand bonus because they've um, achieved a certain level or they surpassed um, a certain level, then we have to make sure that that bonus that they that they want it, it does equate to up to two thousand dollars. But there's also managing performance as well. Um, one thing we, what we need to do is keep on, uh, keep communicating one on one with our with our team members and employees. Keep them motivated and making sure that their that their goals are not only aligned to to our goals and to our um, vision and values, but making sure that we we're helping them achieve that as well through through our management and through through the career plan. It would be great if we can catch up with our team members at least on a um, every six months, but quarterly. Um, is great, but even if we have you know five or ten minutes for a coffee every every month, that would be that would be um, ideal as well. Just to make sure that um, we're on track and aligned to where, um, how how they're tracking. For some of us on the line today, there may be one or um, only very very few staff members, so we may need to consider outsourcing and offshoring, which is something that is is growing in, in the accounting profession. According to B Star. Um, from last year's survey, at least 30% of accounting firms are using some sort of outsourcing or offshoring um, at the moment. And that's only going to grow with the, um, with the cost of producing work here in Australia and the, and the cost of, of involved of doing compliance work um, that we do. Clients are now starting to shop around and try and look for the cheapest um, accountant to do their, uh, account, their end of year accounting compliance and financials. Another thing to do to get back to basics is looking at our software, and that's coming from both internal and for your client as well. We need to become specialists in software, um, having, our, uh, having our own certifications. It would be ideal if one, of, one team member or several team members are experts or champions in particular, cloud software with zero, myob, uh, QuickBooks, CCH, etc. That they we can go to, to um, for training or to get advice on what's the best way to to do things or the most efficient way to process process information as well. And likewise, the accounting software for clients. If we can have some um, specialists there as well, then they can be the go-to person for any client inquiries. Um, and, and also, any if there's any updates that have been provided or changes provided to our software, then the champion could provide that information back to the staff member and also to the clients, um, highlighting the changes and the efficiencies that have been gained as well. We just need to figure out now how to get our clients onto the cloud, and that's a large process in itself. But one thing what we can do and what we can start doing is identifying all those business clients or clients with entities with, with software at the moment or not using software. So basically having columns in the spreadsheet with currently using cloud software, currently using desktop software, using other software such as uh, spreadsheets or, or a cash book software or just not using software as well, using, um, using a shoebox or just providing everything that's written down. We need to get those clients onto onto the software because moving forward, they need to be on software for, for payroll purposes and that's part of the way the ATO is going. So we need to be keep in mind of that. But at the same time, we can understand that a lot of clients will not want to go onto software for, for whatever reason, whether it's costs or they need to learn the, learn the, learn the, the software again. But some, that's something we need to consider and have the discussions with the client on what their options are. And their options could be is that whether or not they have to go into the software or that we can't service in, as an accountant um, with them as well. We have to use the technology to run our practice. So whatever um, we choose moving forward to, with the software, that, that will be where we're going at the moment. Every, 
all the suppliers and all the vendors are going down the cloud path. And whether we like it or not, we have to embrace it. From a practice management point of view, from an internal point of view, everything's going into the cloud, whether it's a practice management um, software, the CRM, our job flow, our document management system, our sub-managed super funds, our corporate compliance and our tax modules, um, and payment gateways as well. And now, now we have the opportunity to, to embrace uh, the, the portals being introduced by our vendors and having our clients having our clients sign electronically, but even having the documents stored in their um, in the portal as well, so they can access it and review it at any time that they need to, and that they need to. The value added software um, and services as well we need to consider, and we'll be talking more about that later on in the in the in the presentation. It's based on we have to do it based on our current clients' requirements, so. Are we looking at cash flow forecasting, um, business advisory software, point of sale software and stock management, CRM and marketing software, and also for them, the document management and storage software. It's a software that's there that we need to identify that would be suitable for the client and why they need to be, why they need to embrace it and take it on board to, as far as that can help them um, grow, their, grow their business. The next part of getting back to basics is the policies and procedures. I'm a big advocate of every, every client um, uh, in the client group having engagement letters. This provides an understanding and the scope of what, what's to be done as part of the services concerned. And to some um, accountants, they also include services that's not included as part of the engagement. It also provides us with an understanding of responsibilities and also provides us with an understanding of the price and um, that's involved. And, and the payment and the payment terms. I believe the engagement letters it uh, can be used to minimise the, the misunderstandings of what's what's to be provided and not to be provided, and to be a clarification and official documentation of what the client is getting for the service that they agreed to and they signed off on. And anyway, having engagement letters is part of our affiliation with our with our. Um, uh, accounting um, bodies, whether the CPA, IPA or the or CANS as well. So what are your tools and templates? What are you using and are they being used consistently? And do we have only one copy? Do we have only one copy and one template for standard letters, for policies and procedure manuals and FL work papers as well? As far as our policies and procedures manuals, are we aware of and are our team members are aware of our, um, what our policies and procedures are. Is there any misunderstandings or um, et cetera? By well, having these simple things implemented and, and, and used and agreed to, this provides us a good stead on how us in growing our firm. So it, it, it alleviates the misunderstanding and the uncertainty of what needs to be done and what needs to be used. And that leads to number four with respect to um, the consistency. Uh, do we have consistency of, 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 what we're, of what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve within our firm? If we need to, we need to look at the uh, providers um, to, to provide us with the tools and templates. There, there are many people out there, many providers out there that can have temp tools and templates ready to go that we can use, that you, that you can use, that be consistent and that you use straight away. So there's something we can, that you can consider as well. There needs to be reper repercussions if the if the team members are not following our, our, our processes and, and policies and procedures. But the repercussions are give back if, if it's at review stage and they haven't followed all the guidelines or provided with the necessary information to give back to work and make sure that they do that. And if there's if there's constant uh, misunderstanding or constant ignorance, I suppose, with respect to uh, not using or following procedures. There may be some re-education and training required for the um, for the team member. Again, these little things will help us effectively grow our firm um, in 2020. And the last thing to, to, to talk about today with respect to getting back to basics is our workflow. We need to create an efficient workflow process and product and basically a production line for our for our business, for our accounting firm. We talk, about, we talk about the accountability and we talk about all, um, automation as well. So we've got a clean database 
we've got we've allocated accountants to our we've allocated accountants to to clients and to client groups and they can manage the workflow and they can manage the jobs from there and we've also spoken about clients who are on getting clients onto software and what the process it is to get them onto the software it is going to be a long process particularly for those clients who um, that we don't regularly see but we have to get them onto the onto the software somehow by giving a proper workflow process and workflow system we have accountabilities and milestones that we can create you know, who is doing what um, who's responsible for each job who's responsible for each milestone for example if it's a, um, if we're doing a pre-job or, or getting all the information to, together that be could that could be done by an administration person if it's processing the job that's done by an accountant if it's reviewing the job that's done by either a manager or a partner and if it's collating that could be done by an administration person so we can design a workflow system and job flow system in such a way that they know those particular employees or employee groups and know exactly what they need to do at any given point of time because they'll get live they'll get live information as far as what workflow is concerned we want to encourage our accountants to provide as they're processing the work to provide any ideas on anything any um, value that we can add to the client is from what they're seeing in processing the job we can set up um, um, a list that the client or a rule that the accountant can provide and needs to provide at least two to three possible options or opportunities that they can identify that the partner or the manager can review at the review at the review stage in which they can pass on and talk to the accounting firm uh, to the um, to, uh, to the client we have to look for um, automation opportunities as as we discussed before and and triggers in relation to knowing that when a milestone is reached that the next person part of that milestone is fully aware that they need that they need to do that part of the job so we're talking about scheduling we're talking about timelines and we're also talking about budgets here making sure they're all aware and we're kept up to date but what do we do when the work is completed what is next what i like to see from accounting from uh, particularly with the partners is to sit down with those a b and possibly c clients um when the, when the work is done and the compliance work is done so they can go through um, the work and identify the valued opportunities and talk to them about what how we can help them um, achieve their achieve those um, issues and challenges that they may be having we create the agenda we we add value to your uh, we provide the valued opportunities in the meeting and identify the areas of concern and how we can help them and then we can book a meeting from that meeting as well so ideally for, for time saving, et cetera, it'd be great if they can come into, if the client can come into the office um, just for the saving your, your, um, your time. But there'll be times when you may need to go to the, um, to, to the premises of the client as well. So this is something we can think of to, in relation to, to grow your firm and with the aim of providing some value, value added opportunities that we could talk to the client about uh, that we've identified in the workflow process. So the next part of the webinar is what activities we need to do to grow our firm. And there's, there's, there's five areas here, and there could be a lot more. But the one thing I want to talk to you about is today is culture, marketing plan, a client onboarding process. Uh, yeah, I'll explain a bit more about that as well. Um, regular meetings and the service offering and pricing, in which we'll, we'll spend some time on um, this afternoon. But the first thing we'll talk about is the mission, vision and values and the culture of the firm. I'll preface this by saying that discussing mission and vision values and um, planning and strategy is a whole new is a whole webinar. But in in a nutshell, we need to get agreements and alliance. Also, if you if you're a multiple multiple partner firm, um, of what your what your mission vision values are, and having your team members embrace that as well, and even having your team members help you define what the what what the mission vision values is, because that will define our culture. And they will define um, what we're trying to do here and what we're trying to build and who we are as, a, as an accounting firm. So the great place to start is have a one day planning day, in which I'll talk to you about towards the end of the, in, at the end of today's webinar and develop the, uh, the plan to identify what we're trying to build, you know, who we are, 
to stop, start and continue doing as well. There may be things that we're doing in our firm that, that is, doesn't provide any value or it is inefficient that we can either stop doing or trying to improve in some particular way, shape or form. Another area we need to look at is our marketing plan. And we need to create the plan relevant to our mission, vision and values. So I've got six uh, points here that we can, we can talk about. But the first thing we can do, and basically at no cost, is ask our clients if they, can, if they know of anybody who can use, uh, who can use um, the services that we're providing. Is our current clients happy with what we're doing? Is our current clients happy with um, the services that they're getting and they know that, um, that they, they understand what services we do offer? Can they refer us to, to some um, like-minded um, individuals or businesses that they know of um, that we can do the accounting work for? What is, our, what is our website and social media plan? As I mentioned before, it's a part of the validation. 10, 15 years ago, when we we're looking for an accountant or anybody um, and to try to um, verify and validate them, we, we would look in the yellow pages or the, or the white pages. These days, it's the website and the social media plan and the social media and their, and their activity on that. And, but our website should also have what our services, um, what our service offering is, but outlining the services in a different way, not in the, not in the traditional, we do tax and compliance, et cetera, but develop a website that it's, it's more about the client than it is about what we, what we do. The people and and the people that we have and the people that we have working for us, who we are as a as a firm and what we stand for, that could be part of our um, disclosing our mission, vision, and values. Showing our blogs and um, newsletters on our website, which lets people know who are visiting our website that, that we are we are quite smart. We are on top of things when it comes to businesses and to and to to the clients' needs. One thing that's pretty big in the last couple of years is the amount of videos of, um, that have been um, provided on websites now and, and part of social media that, uh, that have been done by accounting firms. And that's, that also engages and helps with, uh, with SEO as well. We also need to identify who our strategic alliances are. And we all have a strategic alliances, but it's not necessarily documented or we don't have a plan on how we can um, continue um, talk, talking to them. One thing we, what we need to do is, and this will help us effectively, effectively grow our firm, is that we should segment our strategic alliances and list them in our, in our practice management system or our CRM and have, and have a, a commitment to catch up with them at least, at least quarterly to see how things are going, anything that's new in the industry that they're working in and anything that's, um, that's come up that, um, that, they've, that they've met that they can, that they can talk. They can refer you to. The whole aim here is for the strategic alliances and keep in contact with them is to make sure that you are front of mind when they talk to somebody who needs an accountant. And that's basically the aim and the goal. You also talk to the strategic, strategic alliances about what you're doing in, in your firm as well, what additional services that, you, that you're providing and what you're seeing and what you're seeing in the, in the, in, in the business world. And having, having possibly doing a presentation to their clients or to, or to, or to their database about, about business and what you're seeing. Another aspect is networking and advertising. And that just goes without saying that we provide a network to, and provide networking in relation to um, our strategic alliances, networking groups, and even forming um, networking um, groups within our client base as well. And that can also add value to our, to our business. But we need to keep track of who's referring us to clients for um, for validity and I suppose for um, for thank you purposes and to identify who's referring them and and what projects that potentially we could be working on together with with the referees and and the client and yourself. You could also create functions for networking and to increase the referrals. And again, it doesn't you don't need to it, it doesn't have to be an expensive thing. It could be something that we can do. Um, every six months or every quarter in your office or somewhere on site with just some nipplings and drinks. 
and we can ask we can ask the clients and we can ask our strategic alliances to bring a friend or like or fellow business owner or like-minded person to the event to get them to get to know them and to uh, hopefully that they can that we can do some work for them as well. Now, I mentioned before about client onboarding um, as a as a way to effectively grow your firm. Yes, we we all get new clients every year, but at the same time, um, is there a wow factor that we can provide them? And and to some some of you on the on the on the webinar today, that's that's an absolute yes. So what we want to do, we want to enhance the client experience pretty much straight away, um, and hopefully we can have potential referral opportunities immediately and right from the get go. So as far as your client onboarding process, what is your process as far as, as, far as a lead? And if the lead comes from certain avenues, whether it's uh, over the phone, by a referral, through your website, or through a walk-in, what is your process? And how do you, how do you go about dealing with that um, at the moment? And with the, as far as the process of the lead, we, we need to talk about here, and need to identify the process from the client onboarding point of view, from the time that they inquire to the time to the time they sign up um, and sign that engagement letter, we need to identify what the process is and what the what the responsibility for each part of that process is and what we need to do. There's relevant timing and uh, between stages that we need to uh, monitor and, and schedule in, and also, you know, what does the prospective customer receive and when? Do they get a welcome pack? Um, any email that we send them, do they have to see some testimonials or um, some uh, a news clipping that's relevant to their business as part of the onboarding? Just those little things will increase the wow factor with the hope that they can refer clients uh, and like-minded business owners to you pretty much straight away. But most importantly, what, what do you need to achieve for the client in the first 30 to 60 days? Um, a lot of clients who come on board uh, either uh, disgruntled with uh, the current uh, accountant, or they've outgrown their, their their current accountant, and they need to and they need to um, speak to an accountant like yourselves, who's a bit more professional, adverse, and a bit more intelligent in relation to understanding their needs. So yeah, there are things that we mean we may need to do immediately that once we get right, that um, that lead us in good stead for a long term relationship with the client. But the great thing about it as well is the positioning and getting the accountants involved who's been working on the file, introducing to that um, client pretty much straight away. And that the accountant that they've been introduced to is the first point of call. And they'll, although you're, just, you're still responsible for the, uh, for the client, if there's any issues or challenges, then the client knows that they can, that they can contact the client for them to answer. And obviously, if they're stumped on a particular uh, question or uh, question or a query, then we could, they can either speak to uh, the team members around them or come and speak to you directly in relation to getting a, a direct answer. So the second last thing I want to talk to you about today is, is activities we need to do is, is meetings. And believe it or not, having, um, having regular meetings um, can help you grow your firm. So I'm talking about your staff meetings, workflow meetings, and even partner meetings. And if you are a sole practitioner, then it's okay to meet with yourself um, on that regular basis and uh, go through uh, what's required on the agenda. But you've got to have a purpose for each meeting and you don't, you don't run the meeting for the sake of running the meeting. You have a set agenda and time. Um, I can provide you with some examples of the agenda items that could be, that, that you could think about. As far as a staff meeting is concerned, that could be just done monthly, maybe during lunchtime to minimise uh, productivity downtime. And some of the th things on the agenda that we can talk to, talk about are what's working and not working within the practice. What things that we that we're doing at the moment that you know we could do either do better, or that's just not working at all, or that's working exceedingly well, and we could potentially improve. We can get an update from the office champion on the changes to the software that's been made that they're looking after and provide them with and they can provide with the um, staff members and the partners on some efficiency gains and way to do things in the software that in increases efficiency and effectiveness 
we can talk about the client experience as well, whether it's good or bad, and um, and and what's resulted out of out of us working with the with the client. Hopefully, that most of the time it is it is good, and what we've done and what we've done to make that a client experience a great experience, whether it's we've attended to something, whether we've, we've, we've attended to something um, um, urgently for them, um, or that some of the, uh, the advice we've, we've provided them has has provided really good results for their, for their business. And even um, from a partner point of view, just how we're going operationally, um, you might want to disclose how we're tracking to budget, et cetera, um, and disclose some key, key KPIs. But more importantly, um, the findings that, you, that you've seen in the review stage um, in relation to, is, it, is there any training that's required by the staff members of what you've seen at the review stage? or even adherence to the processes and procedures or the lack of. So, and just reminding the team members of what the processes and procedures are. And all the value that opportunities that were raised and how we discussed it with the, how we raised it with the client and the improvements that we've made on the, on the client's behalf because of, of, of the accountant's um, suggested thoughts on value added opportunities and options. Then there's a workflow meeting as well. And the workflow meeting is, should be done at least weekly prefer at the beginning of the week. We just need to identify just three or four things. One is what jobs will be going out this week and are they are, are they on track and on target? It's from a from a from a date point of view and also from a budgeting point of view. And the second thing is if we are exceeding budget on a particular job, we have to talk about why, or if we're not going to meet budget, we have to talk about why we, why then and there pretty much straight away and let the client know and we'll, at least for the partner to make a decision. As far as the jobs meetings concerned, we also have to we have, have to talk about exactly what jobs are yet to come in, and what jobs are coming in pursuant to the um, a, uh, to the lodgement list from the ATO. But at the same time, if we are struggling, if the accountants are struggling to get uh, to get queries answered and resolved from the from the client, then the partners may need to uh, get involved to speed up the process. Then obviously, there's the partners meetings as well. And that, obviously that's the most important part of um, running of the business. But they have to make sure that they look at the, the financials, including the debtors and upcoming cash outflows and cash inflows as well. And what the, the key metrics and the key KPIs that they're measuring and making sure that they're, they're on track and they're aligned to the, uh, to the strategic plan. We we'll talk about uh, the new clients that come on board from a marketing point of view. And also those potential clients that are in the pipeline, um, where they've come from, who's referred us, whether it's clients or contingent um, alliances, and what the potential dollar value is to, to the business um, or to the accountant firm as well. But we also have to talk about um, why we lost clients and the, and the churn. Um, and, and also identify those clients who are on fixed fees and can we increase that for, for regular cash flow. Um, for coming into the business and also provide updates to our lodgement lists and what work needs to be coming and also to maybe to a lesser extent the ASIC register of what, what work needs to, um, to go out from a, from a um, company review point of view. But why the meetings as far as um, the activities we need to do to grow our business? It's making sure we kept aligned and it's making sure that we kept accountable and we're meeting time, time frames and budgets. It's potentially uh, delegating more duties to our accounting team members and, um, and administration team um, uh, moving forward once we get the efficiencies and effectiveness in place, but making sure we're aligned to the strategic plan and the goals and the timeframes that we have set as well. So the last thing we talk about to the, as far as activities we need to do um, right now is, is a service offering. And this is something that I just want to spend some time on. As far as, extending, as far as accounting and compliance is concerned, with most accounting firms and most partners, that's all they basically know, which is absolutely fine from a, from a tax and knowledge point of view. But we can also extend our compliance offering to our clients that could be part of something a bit bigger from that point of view. It's just a subtle change to what we offer to the, uh, to the client, but it, it is, it is um, a mindset shift 
that we can make that official as part of a, a menu of service or as part of the engagement letter. So what I'm talking about here is yes, we'll end up do, we'll do your accounting and compliance for you at the end of the financial at the end of the financial year, and we um, you know uh, and with with the uh, tax returns as well. But on top of that, as far as our offering for compliance, is that we'll offer an annual general meeting. And what I'm talking about here is that we'll go through the results of the of the financials and the, and um, and the tax return and, in, and the implications as part of the meeting. So we have a face to face meeting um, when when you complete the accounts, as we just mentioned. You create the agenda and you go through the accounts and identify what went well and what needs to be attended to and how the cash was utilised in any ways we can improve that. And we can go through the key business drivers. And if we're, if we're catching up with the clients at their premises, we can walk around the premises and identify any key issues or in their processing, in their layout, in the production line or the, the production plants, and even possibly in staff behaviour as well, just to give them a, a bit of an um, outsider's point of view or from an advisory point of view or things that they, they can look at to improve their business. And the other thing too is that with our clients as well, we can offer tax planning uh, meetings in April and May. We've identified our database and we've allocated the responsibilities of our jobs to, to the accountants, so they manage the job flows and the workflows. We've allocated our clients to um, uh, cloud, cloud software so we can dial in and look at their software uh, at any particular point in time and making sure that the bookkeepers or the processing is up to date. And, and if there's any discrepancies, we can talk to them about them and then and there. And from a tax planning point, point of view, we can get, um, we can review, get some interim accounts and um, provide some tax, tax planning advice. You know what to do here as far as tax planning um, is concerned and how the, how the clients can save tax or move cash or um, try to um, increase, uh, or even looking at something as simple as buying another building, et cetera. But if we can provide that as part of a service, particularly with our A and B type clients, that could, that could be part of our compliance offering. And the last thing we could talk about is as part of the compliance offering that we'll do the basis for them. Um, something quite uh, simple. And then we, uh, every time we do the basis on a quarterly basis, we can have a, a quarterly meeting. Um, we, we're doing that already with the annual general meeting and a tax planning meeting. So we can incorporate another couple of meetings during the course of the year um, around about BAS time. So we, we can keep uh, making sure that, that the clients are growing, they're, they're keeping track to budget, and they're keeping track to their strategic plan and their planning process as well. A lot of you on the firm, on the, on the, on the webinar today, are doing some or all this, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, but this is just something that we, you can think about that you're not doing, um, that you can move forward and present to your, to your, um, to your clients. As far as advisory services is concerned, is that we need to identify what is advisory services to you. When I talk to accounting firms and we go to their building and I see on their signage or their letterhead, um, ABC, um, proprietary limited accountants and business advisors, what I ask them what advisory means to them. A lot of responses I've received is we do cash flow forecasting, profit and loss statements, and profit and loss um, um, forecasting as well. And also some, um, we provide a report that provides them with um, uh, variations and discrepancies um, for, on, on transactions or accounts from this from this year compared to last year. To me, that's not advisory. That's part of advisory. There's a whole lot more to advisory, which I'll talk about today um, and later on in, in a couple of slides time. But regardless of advisory services and what you want to do with your client, we need, to, uh, we need to identify what you, what you can offer them that will make you unique. Are we offering advisory services that are, that are applicable to our clients? Or are we offering advisory, and or are we offering advisory services that will be applicable to uh, our new target market? Or whatever it is, we have to provide a proof of concept. And what I mean here is that we need to you know, talk to our top five, 10 clients, talk to them about exactly what we're doing as far as a firm and, and the services that we're, we want to offer and the, and, the, and, the, and the pricing involved and get their feedback and get their thoughts on it. And also talk to, the, talk to your team members about it as well. 
and maybe even other accounting that you in, as part of your network and strategic alliances. Once you get a uh, once you get a basic um, foundation and basis of what the advisory services are going to be, if it's going to be a menu of services or um, a bronze, silver, gold, platinum type arrangement, then you can take it to the wider market and and talk to your um, clients about it, and maybe even have it advertised or listed in your in your website as well. But at the same time, do do your clients know what your what your services you're offering right um, that you offer and what they are and right now? So you need to talk to your clients about that, and also talk to your clients about what um, what other services that you can provide them that would be suitable to them. But before you, before all that, you need to think about a few things. What are your clients' needs? And you need to articulate the value, as I mentioned before, through that proof of concept. Have your team think about the opportunities when they're, when they're processing the work, which I've mentioned a couple of times at, um, at the moment. How do you price the services? And why are you doing this particular service? You need to really dig down and identify why and, and what is the value that you can provide to the client. That is the service offering that you provide, do you need to embrace the add-ons from um, the cloud providers at the moment? And do, can, do, you, do you need to embrace the, uh, the advantages of artificial intelligence? Getting your team members involved will, will help you to send you in great stead because you, you just cannot do this on your own. It's a big team effort that you need to roll out to your clients to your, as part of your marketing and also part of your website as well, and just roll out to your clients. And each time we get in front of them and talk to them about the new service offering that we're providing. And obviously getting our strategic alliances involved and letting them know exactly what we're offering as well. So a couple of ideas that I've got here for you that, um, that you can think about from a, business advisory or value added services point of view is just listed here in front of you. And as you can see here, there's not necessarily to do with the monetary or cash uh, or financial advisory. There's also got to do with systems. It's got to do with marketing as well. And it's got to do with um, coaching and mentoring and developing and developing um, systems and integrations, even providing valuations, which some of you on the line are doing at, as part of your services, which is, which is great. But the great thing about it is that you don't need to do all this. You can have a panel of experts that are part of your strategic alliance. They can, they, you, you can, um, they can do it for you and you can get um, part, a part of the fee as well. So but if you're passionate about some of these things um, that you want to do yourself, then go ahead, go, go and create that. Go and create that service offering and go and, go and do it. I think the coaching and mentoring of, of clients, particularly those clients who've gone from, um, pay, pay as you go to a sole trader is, is a great idea. Um, developing the systems for, um, for businesses as well as part of um, their policies and procedures and, there's, um, and, and, and their processes. As I mentioned, there's plenty of things that we can talk about that, that you can use and develop from here. But again, there's, there's probably others that are not in here that uh, maybe you can consider. But for example, you're, you're an expert in, in property or manufacturing that you want to um, extend that services to as well. So the last thing I want to talk about as part of the agenda is the other options available. And I'll, only, I'll spend a couple of minutes on these. But it's, it's talking about marketing and SEO and purchasing of another uh, of, an, uh, uh, of another accounting firm. We can go now. Once we in, implement our strategy in relation to the website and social media, then we can start using SEOs and search engine optimization. So for basically in a nutshell, it's for search engine opt optimization. It's keywords that we use that if a, if a person puts in, into Google or into their search engine, those keywords, our, our business will come up, hopefully on that front page. Um, however, this can be quite costly and this could be quite and it can take up to 12 months to build and deliver the results. So it's, although it's something that it, it's, it's a long-term long uh, process, it's something maybe you can consider as well, but you, you need to require an IT specialist to help you with the SEO, and you'll need to continue to update your website with the content um, as well. Another great thing is um, what I found out is that if you have video 
on your website for some particular reason. That'll help with the search engine optimization. I don't know how, um, but it can. But it also provides with the search engine, once we get the wording right as well, it will provide a greater awareness of your firm in the, in the, in the searches. Um, so that's just something to think about. As I said, it, it, it does take a while and it does take a lot of, um, I suppose, experimenting um, and testing and measuring on a, on, a, on a monthly basis as well. And the last thing to talk to you about today for other options is concerned is um, possibly purchasing another accounting firm. So I've got the instructions there of what, what we need to consider. Identifying the ideal firm, um, looking, looking, are you looking at a particular area or a location? Um, developing a marketing campaign and uh, marketing to those firms that you're, that you're targeting. But before we do all that, you make sure your finances is in, in order so you know how much you can borrow. But you need to have an understanding that there is, there is a process involved. And there is a process involved pre-purchase, during the um, due diligence and heads of agreement, and also the post-purchase as well. And that leads to six and seven in relation to what the seller is trying to achieve as far as, as part of selling their, their accounting firm and, and how their involvement is uh, with, with the business post, post the purchase and how long they're going to be there for. It's a great idea that the seller is in part of the process as well as part of the, um, the purchase and they're staying on for at least, uh, at least two years, if not shorter, if not longer. Um, depending on the arrangement. So it's for, from a transition point of view and it's from a point of view to, to make sure that the, the process of transitioning the clients from, from basically the old practice to the new practice is, um, is seamless. But it also can, can successfully can yield a great result for both you and the clients and the team members. Um, they, the, the accounting firm that you've purchased may have uh, great systems in place and may have a great team involved as well, in which you may or may not be lacking as well. So there could be a win-win-win for everybody there. So here I've got a summary of what needs to be done. As, as, I, as I mentioned right from the outset, it, just, it was high level stuff, and there's plenty of detail that needs to be done in relation to um, getting done, getting to, to these. But we need to get our foundations right again, back to basics. And we need to um, do these activities um, as well to create that uh, process of effectively growing our firm. And we, knew, we can also have, possibly look at growing our firm through other, other avenues being SEO and purchasing of, another, purchasing of another accounting firm. But most importantly, if you want to grow your firm, you have to be the leader. A leadership is not choice. Leadership is a choice, it's not a rank. So you have to be the leader and lead um, this process. Um, there are some stages, as I mentioned, that we can implement straight away, but there are some also some stages and ideas that it will take time to implement. But it needs to be done. And bottom line, it's, it's in relation to you know, what you what you want to achieve as well out of, out of your business and out of your practice. So it, it's just something that you know, requires a lot of energy and a lot of time and a lot of a lot of help as well. So where to from here? So you've got, you've got three options. You can continue going as you are. And as I said, if you implemented some or all these um, um, ideas and tips, congratulations. And again, I hope I haven't wasted your time. Um, but if you haven't, if you want to implement the changes yourself, go ahead and get your, get your team members to get involved and, and make sure you're, you're, you're properly leading that and you've got a plan in place. But you can also seek the assistance from your business first in which we can help you and keep you accountable, um, help you develop that strategic plan and, and the processes and the, and the duties involved to implement those, those tasks and projects, manage the change, assign the relevant task responsibilities and timeframes, and help you keep on track. So just a bit about your business first. So it, we are a professional services firm that works directly with the accounting profession. And I commenced my career as a business and practice manager in 1996, um, working with an insolvency firm out in, in South Melbourne. And I've developed my career through um, business and practice management um, since then. But with your business first, we were primarily in Victoria and we have got clients around Australia. So we are easily accessible via um, um, internet, Zoom uh, as well. 
and obviously over, over the phone. But my vision for your business first is to be the most valued and respected business partner to the accounting profession here, here in Australia. Um, I want to be pretty much what you are to your clients, the go-to person with respect to referrals, um, advice, arrangements, um, introductions, etc. I want to do the same thing with the accounting profession here in Australia. So, and that's, this is pretty much the services that we offer. And as I mentioned before, um, we offer six key services. But as I mentioned, that as far as our, I, I have to um, ancillary services as well that I provide and offer and that you know, I don't necessarily do, but, but my panel um, of experts and um, uh, strategic alliances will help me, um, help you accomplish those, um, those areas as well. So we have an offer for you today and we offer our planning day and you know, to help you get ready for um, 2020. So the outline of the day is pretty much in three stages. One is the pre-work session, where we have an understanding of who you are as a firm, your ambitions and your and your and your your challenges. Then we have the strategy session in which we work with you and up to five key team members of your team um, um, during the course of the of the day, and we'll conduct a SWOT analysis based on the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But more importantly, we discuss those and then we develop the um, and identify what you should stop, what you should do, stop doing, and start doing, continue doing, um, moving forward. And, and we are under the, identified the three priorities right now that you, that you want to be working on. And then we'll have a planning session as well. And that, that planning session is creating that plan and, that, and planning that timetable of what needs to be done and when over the next 12 to 24 months. And you as the, as the partner present that to the team. So as for, for today, you know, let's organize your planning day. And if you sign up to our planning day by the 31st of May, um, you receive a 10% discount off our fee and there'll be a complimentary follow-up session within the 30 days after implementation. But what you'll get more importantly is that you get to choose a date in June and July, obviously which is subject to availability, which is first in best dressed. Walk away with the plan for the next 12 to 24 months. You'll save on logistics and time to get the venues business conducted in your office and it'll be, it'll be conducted and run and, and chaired by me. Um, have up to five key team members involved in participating. You can replicate the day with your clients. So hopefully that if you have a planning day as part of your services, this could possibly be free for you. And, and you and your team will be aligned with your goals and your plans um, moving forward. So thank you very much for your attendance today. I hope that you got, you got some value out of it. Um, please feel free to send me an email or contact me on my mobile to um, if you want to find out anything a bit more or, or if there's anything that you, you haven't understood. Um, once again, thanks very much. Um, keep, keep an eye out for your, um, in, in, um, in your mailbox for our next webinar, which is in early June on um, shareholders agreements and, the, um, and how to manage um, disputes. Which will be which will be run and conducted um, with one of my panel of experts in the legal field. That should be a really really good and interesting um, webinar. Thank you very much again. Enjoy the rest of the day, and I hope I can speak to you soon. Goodbye.